The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Carmen, and I am a, an education coordinator from Oregon Pacific Area Health Education Center. Um, I'll be your host today, and um, welcome and thanks for joining us. Let's go over some troubleshooting and some housekeeping items. Um, on your GoToWebinar control panel, you will see that all microphones are muted. They'll remain muted during the session. Uh, if you experience audio difficulties, make sure your computer speaker rhythm is up. Um, you will be able to download the slides from the handouts menu. If you have any problem, please send me an email and I'll make sure that you can get them, all right? Use the questions or the chat option for entering your questions or comments at any time. We are recording this webinar and it'll be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, we will email you within an hour of this webinar to send you uh, the information that we are sharing right now, the link to our channel, my email address, and how to obtain CME or CE credit for this event. Um, in order to do that, you will need to go to www.eeds.com and enter this activity code. Keep in mind the activity code expires within one week. All right, write it down. We will repeat it at the end of the webinar and I'll email it to you as well. Um, this webinar is jointly provided by the American Cancer Society, Samaritan Health Services and Oregon Pacific Asia. And the presenters and the planners of this activity report that they have no conflict of interest or relevant financial relationships with any commercial entities that might affect the conduct of this presentation. Um, this webinar is presented by Patrick Haggerty. Uh, Dr. Haggerty is a dentistry practitioner in Albany, Oregon. He's born and raised in Albany, and he started practicing in 1986. He is affiliated with OHSU and his expertise in implant dentistry has made him one of the most sought after dentists in the state. In his free time, Dr. Haggerty enjoys cooking, skiing, and fishing. So now, without further ado, I'll leave you with Dr. Haggerty. Thank you, Carmen. Objectives for the day. We're going to talk about HP. The, the second line there, describe appropriate oral pharyngeal exam with examples of HPV-mediated oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas. We're going to spend some time on that. You'll see the evidence for vaccination. That's very clear and very obvious. But we have a whole cohort of people who are coming through the pipeline who are already infected with strains of HPV that cause this oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. You're going to see these in your office. We'll talk, talk about statistics. There are now more of these oral pharyngeal carcinomas than there is cervical cancer, to give you an idea of the scope of this. We're going to talk about a vaccination schedule based on patient age, uh, recommendations, and how to do it. We're going to develop some self-efficacy in delivering effective HPV vaccination recommendations, and then really how to talk to parents about HPV vaccination We'll touch on vaccination delivery. That is a whole topic by itself. Dentists in the state of Oregon can now administer all vaccinations. Um, and we'll spend a little bit of time on that, but as I said, that's a whole entity unto itself. Understanding the burden, HPV infection and disease. So first warning, there'll be a second one. I'm gonna have a surgical slide, two of them. 
and it's a complete open dissection of an oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma caused by HPV-16, one of the strains that causes cancer. So if you're squeamish about seeing a surgical field, uh, there'll be a second warning. Uh, uh, I'm just giving you a little upfront right now. So let's look at a case. This is what an HPV-mediated oral pharyngeal cancer looks like. You can see the ulcerations. You can see it extending up into the soft palate off laterally here. This tumor is started, I should say, started in the tonsillar bed. Most commonly, these are in the tonsillar bed and base of tongue. You are going to see these in your office. The numbers are unbelievable in how fast the rate is of, of growth for these tumors, for the occurrence of these tumors. It is important to have a discussion ahead of time with staff. You look at this and your reaction will be obvious. And how staff handle that, I think is important for the safety and the comfort of the patient. As long as we keep ourselves patient-centered, I think we'll be just fine. But you need to have that discussion ahead of time. You need to have the discussion with your uh, referral. Are you gonna send this to OMS? oral maxillofacial surgeon, or to ENT. For a de most dental offices, your connection is with OMS. When this biopsy is done, that enters into the medical field, medical insurance billing. And if you think uh, you, that you don't enjoy um, dental insurance, wait till you get into medical insurance. So I have that discussion ahead of time. Do they have the contracts with the different insurance companies? Are they set up to do this? This is a case that Dr. Dan Petrosor uh, gave to me to sh share with you. We're gonna go through the CTs and the actual surgical result. Carmen mentioned my time in private practice. I took four years out here recently to start a general practice residency program at OHSU. The intent is training dentists in hospital dentistry and working in the operating room, largely seeing medically compromised and special needs uh, people and doing all their dentistry in one setting in the operating room. Well, as part of that, I became involved with the cancer reconstruction team. And that was a huge exposure to cancer, completely unexpected, but very serendipitous. Uh, I was very fortunate to work with Dr. Petrosor and, and rebuild, reconstruct people, and really get them back to a, a functioning level. So it's that background that brings me to you today uh, to talk about HPV-mediated oral pharyngeal cancer. So here's the tumor as we look at it. This is the nasal pharyngoscopy. So we've gone into the nose with a scope, and we're looking straight down. So here's base of tongue, the epiglottis, trachea, Here's the posterior pharynx at the top of the slide. And this whole thing on the left side of the slide is tumor. Started in the tonsillar bed and has grown and extended from there. CT scan, we look at the right-hand side of the patient and you can see the mass right here. Look at the detailed anatomy in the unaffected left side and look at this homogeneous mass. And it is already interfering with airway. Further down, one can start seeing some lymph nodes with disease. This is already a metastatic process. And you can see how, I'll use the medical term, ugly this airway is starting to look. Second warning, next two slides are surgical field and they're, <laughs> well, here we go. So here is that same patient, upper jaw, lower jaw, Skin incisions here and soft tissue reflected. The mandible has been bisected and the right hand side rotated out. So here is the mandible that is just sectioned from here, rotated up and out of the way. You can see a tooth here that is mashed into the buccal mucosa that has also been reflected. The man is nasotracheally intubated. You can see the tube going in here, and here it is passing through the oropharynx on down to the trachea. The black areas are where cautery has been used to control bleeding. 
This is what is involved to treat one of these cancers. And so as we go forward and look at all of the statistics and all that is involved in the vaccination for HPV, one has to ask the question, would you rather have this or a vaccination and prevent it from starting in the first place? Next slide. Now that piece of mandible has been brought back down, titanium plate to hold this all together. Here's mental foramen with mental nerve going out into that buccal mucosa, uh, gingiva rather. Soft tissue uh, reapproximation now is starting down below. Again, vaccination or this. HPV types differ in their disease associations. There's over 150 types of uh, HPV. On the right-hand side of the slide, the continuous sites of infection, but over 80 types. These are the common uh, hand and foot warts. What we're talking about today is the mucosal sites of infection and the high-risk or oncogenic cancer-causing varieties of HPV. HPV 16 and 18 are the most common. The surgical slides in the, the case that you just saw was HPV 16. This is the cervical cancer, anogenital, oral pharyngeal, cancer precursors, and low-grade cervical disease. There's another branch of mucosal that are non-oncogenic. However, they do have results here with the warts, papillomas, and cervical disease. Most females and males will be infected with at least one type of um, HPV. It's the teen in uh, college age years uh, when the term is used, sexual debut. That's when most infections uh, occur. Women will find out about it with their uh, pap smear. That is exactly what the pap smear is looking for, is the presence of the virus and or tissue that has been affected by the virus and is in the process of changing. Most people will never know that they've been infected. This is a slide with a lot of information in it. I'll let it kind of work with you here. The two things that I would point out, the cervix and oropharynx, and look at these numbers. Now this is a study that was very detailed that covered 2012 to 2016. 2021, this number is much, much lar larger. This is held fairly constant. Notice the difference between female and male. In males, it's the oropharynx. There is something about the cervix that is able to be infected and cleared most of the time. However, in the oropharynx, that doesn't happen. Things go on more often to a tumor. You can see the other areas of the body that are infected, very important, but certainly much less than these two uh, top and bottom bars. Here we are looking at race and ethnicity, and again, um, of oral pharyngeal cancer. We look at the, the left-hand side here where everything's combined. You can see the difference between men and women. Differences in sexual practices is thought to be the difference here within race, maybe. Cervical precancer in US females. There are 196,000 high-grade lesions every year. This is what's known as a cone biopsy. The uh, uh, cervix, is a round incision is made and then straight back into the opening uh, of, of the cervix in what's known as a cone biopsy. This removes the infected tissue and the, and the cells that have been, have changed as a result of HPV infection. Oral pharyngeal versus cervical. Women have a whole system in place around cervical cancer and screening. One could even say a whole guilt trip. Oral pharyngeal cancer is more common, yet there is no streamlined screening process. And that last word, that last sentence exploded, quite a medical term, but boy, it sure explains it. It paints out just how severe this is. HPV vaccine is cancer prevention, is cancer prevention. Any of you may remember when this first rolled out in 2007, it was to uh, treat a sexually transmitted infection and vaccination rates bombed. 
it did not work. The folks in charge, CDC largely, others realized we've got an image issue here. Why are we doing this? We're doing this to prevent cancer. That's why we have the HPV vaccine. The actual vaccine is a recombinant L1 capsid and it forms what is known as virus-like particles. So the immune system recognizes this, thinks this is a, a virus and produces a, a, an immune response with higher levels of antibody than a natural infection. And it's important to say that this is virus light. It is not the virus. It is non-infectious and non-oncogenic. There have been three different types of HPV vaccine. The first one was bivalent, and it was uh, for the, the two mean ones, the 16 and 18. The quadrivalent came out, and this was uh, in addition, it covered the genital warts, and then the nine valent most recently, and the current one that is used and recommended. It picks up the five on the other end of the spectrum that are known to cause cancer, oncogenic varieties. Gardasil is the one to be using. These others, no. Question comes, what if I've had this, one of these two um, vaccines, and maybe I'm back in the, in the, uh, the dating scene for whatever reason, and have potentially exposure to other, some of these other viruses, do I need to get the Gardasil 9? That's a discussion to have with your primary care or the, the person who has uh, administered the vaccine. There's recommendations that, that uh, maybe that should happen, the Gardasil 9. Vaccination recommendation, age 11 or 12 years. You can start as early as age nine. It's two doses up through age 14. What they found in the clinical trials is that this age group, nine to 14, has such a robust response, immune response to the vaccine, that it only takes two doses. 15 and older, it's three doses. The check mark here is that this is kind of a golden time. Mom and dad's IQ is uh, still fairly substantial. Uh, they haven't started to go stupid as it happens up in here that one can get this child vaccinated with all that is needed to include the HP vaccination. Start at age nine, two doses of the vaccine as we discussed. Second dose of the vaccine should be administered six to 12 months after the first dose. And again, this is if the series is started before the 15th birthday. Over age 15, this is the schedule. HPV vaccine recommendations, vaccination for everyone through age 26 years, if not previously adequately vaccinated. Notice the term adequately. Maybe an old uh, vaccine was used. Do we need to bump it to the Gardasil 9? In general, it's not recommended for folks uh, over 26, but it has been approved through age 45. This is a discussion to have with a clinician. Um, uh, you know, is someone back in the game, so to speak, and there's potential exposure? Um, the issue here is that there's likely already been exposure to HPV. Um, is, the, is the vaccination of any value? Well, you know, that you, you would assume that it was likely maybe one or two varieties, but not that whole spectrum that Gardasil 9 uh, protects from. Dosing schedules, again, a bit of a repeat, but it's important to, to see how this works out. Starting the vaccine series before the 15th birthday, two doses of the HPV vaccine, six to 12 months after the first dose. Minimum interval is five months between them. The three dose regimen after the 15th birthday, we looked at that before in the previous slide, but just to see it in a different form. How is it done? We administer the HPV vaccine intra intramuscular, it's an IM injection, needle size, inch to inch and a half, 22 to 25 gauge, the deltoid muscle, of course, aseptic technique, of course, new needle and syringe. It's amazing that we have to repeat that. And 
that last line, administer at the same medical visit as other adolescent vaccines. Refrigeration, of course, original packaging, critical line here, do not freeze the vaccine. HPV vaccine safety. Always, you know, our vaccine safe, this comes up. Small group of people are realized, but very noisy. Here are four groups that at a national level supervise vaccine safety. CDC, the FDA, in different combinations, academic centers, uh, healthcare systems, and other partner organizations. And as you can see from these numbers, they are substantial. The healthcare system one is over 12 million in the FDA and partner organization program called PRISM, 170 million individuals are in their database, huge. Specifically with the HPV vaccine, HPV vaccines are safe. Like any other vaccine, injection site reactions, pain, redness, swelling in the arm, fever headaches. Contraindication is someone who is allergic to yeast. Obviously that's how the uh, virus has grown is in it, a, a yeast uh, medium. As with any injection, brief fainting spells are possible, syncope, um, and then related symptoms. In my practice, it seems to be the teenage boys that we have the issue with. One could keep the patient seated 15 minutes or even lying down if you're concerned about a syncopal episode. It is safe. It has a good safety profile. As we said, the CDC and FDA continues to monitor and evaluate the safety of uh, HPV vaccines and certainly along with all vaccines. One can look your pa parents in the eye and say, this is safe and this is needed. What happens with the, the vaccine? What is the impact? In the early years, it reduces the HPV prevalence out in the population, reduces genital warts. Years to decades, uh, cervical intraepithelial uh, neoplasia is reduced, precancers in other words. And then laid out comes uh, uh, decades, HPV-associated cancers. That case that we looked at um, earlier, that gentleman may have been infected for 30 years. That's how long it took to get that tumor to that point. It's a long time. And that's to repeat again, you're going to see these cases in your office. Uh, once the impact started, once the vaccine started in the United States, uh, declines were noted almost immediately in general wards, cervical uh, precancers, and the vaccine type prevalence. Cervical precancer incidence rates among screened women. Uh, the vaccine was first available in 2007. You can see the two different age groups here, the 21 to 24 year olds. Um, the, the, the rate dropped almost in half. Big reduction in the 18 to 20 year olds as well. In Australia, <clears throat> if you look at Australian born females and males diagnosed as having genital warts at a first visit, 2007 is when this became available. And notice what the graph does, plummets. Under 21 years, huge drop. Over 30 years, pretty level. You can see the difference in the age when uh, this uh, vaccine is administered. So jump to the males. This was not, uh, uh, males were not vaccinated in 2007. That didn't start happening until later. Here's your evidence of H, less HPV in the population. Duration of pre uh, protection, it is thought that this is going to be long lasting. Um, at least 10 years. Again, the CDC, FDA is following this uh, uh, to see indeed does this need a booster? Uh, what is going to happen long term? HPV vaccine is safe. Benefits far outweigh any potential risks. And again, the previous slides of that case, which is worse? 
Safety studies are similar to the meningitis and Tdap vaccines. Uh, uh, very reassuring. Um, it works. The previous slides show that the impact is that early and mid outcomes um, uh, are excellent in multiple countries. And we know now that there's no waning protection and it lasts. How do you talk about the HPV vaccine? How do you frame the conversation? Well, let's look at what vaccination rates are. The top two lines are Tdap and one of the meningitis vaccines. So people are getting vaccinated. However, look at the HPV, much, much less. It's not being recommended. That's the issue. One could also look at the initial rollout that was frankly blown, where it was tied to a sexually transmitted infection instead of just saying cancer prevention. Could be some remnants of that, I don't know. Rural areas consistently lower. Look over time here, this five-year time span, it you know hovers right around 12% all the way through. Why is that? Fewer patients in rural areas report receiving a recommendation. Here are the rates from 2018. Urban area, 77% of the time is recommended in rural areas, 70. Vaccination coverage is higher among those reporting a recommendation. Did you receive a recommendation? 78% yes, no, 22. What does that result in? A 75% vaccination rate as opposed to less than half if there's no recommendation. We have to talk about this. It has to be part of our presentation to patients. Our staff have to be educated as to um, how we recommend it, when we recommend it on a unified front. While I was at OHSU, there was a primary care clinic who will remain unnamed who noticed that suddenly vaccines were starting to pile up in the storage area. And some of them were actually getting to a uh, expiration date. For some reason, vaccines were not occurring at the regular rate. A little bit of detective work found out that there was one person at the front desk checking people in who was an anti-vaxxer and made sure everyone who checked in knew that. You've gotta be on a unified front and look at the science. Look at the science. Top reasons for not recommending the HPV vaccine. Uh, reasons for not starting it. It wasn't recommended. These other areas we can speak to, no, not sexually active. Um, when does that happen? Uh, don't you want this child ready? You can't pick their partners. You can't pick the history of their partners. Lack of knowledge, not needed or necessary safety concerns, you can speak to all of those. You definitely can speak to being not recommended. Clinicians consistently underestimate what parents place is the value of the HPV vaccine. We think, I'll own it, that parents don't think it's important. They do look at this straight across. They have it in the same ballpark as all the others. And yet we think, they don't find it important. They do. The perceived and real concerns of parents influence how clinicians recommend HPV vaccine. So let's align those, the perceived and real. Give an effective recommendation to receive it. There's strong evidence to support the safety. As we know, moms are the healthcare decision makers and families. In focus groups, consistently they say they trust their child's clinician and they would get the vaccine as long as it was recommended from the clinician. Are you going to recommend it? What is an effective recommendation for HPV vaccination? Same way, do it the same every time, same day, do all the vaccinations, same time, same day. Group all of the vaccinations together. 
when you talk about Tgap and meningococcal vaccines, which is this early preteen age group, HPV is just in the in the same sentence. You're going to protect against meningitis, HPV cancers, and pertussis. Period. Bundle them. Talk about them together. It's a group. This is the next stage. This is what needs to happen. Here's a sample of a, of a comment. How you would present it to mom. We'll give those shots today. We'll talk about that sentence here in a moment. House Bill 2220 allows dentists to administer vaccines in Oregon. I gave the testimony at the House uh, Healthcare Committee uh, in support of HB 2220, gave the presentation or the testimony on behalf of the Oregon Dental Association. All of us in the dental field know that this is well within the wheelhouse. My presentation to the uh, healthcare committee was on the really on the basis of HPV. We need to get the, this vaccine out into the public, but all the vaccines need to be there. How many dental offices will be giving vaccines? You know, I don't know. It's a whole nother level of storage. Again, you're getting back into medical billing. Is that something you want to tackle? My office, we're in the operating room two days a week. We also do uh, sleep apnea appliances. And so we're very comfortable with medical billing, billing, but it is an animal unto itself. Whether or not dentists are actually giving the vaccines or someone in the office, we still need to be involved in the discussion. Why does my child need the HPV vaccine? It's important, it prevents cancer, and that's why I'm recommending your child start the HPV vaccine series today. So, excuse the phone. Have a relationship with the primary care practices in your area have their card, have, have information available. Your child is due for this. Next time you're in to see the doctor, let's make an appointment right now with your doctor. We'll call for you. Let's set up that appointment. Maintain the energy of what you have talked about that day if you're not administering vaccines. What cancers are caused by HPV infection. That might be a, a question that, that you're asked by mom. And you can keep it sim simple, the genitals and throat. You can go into details if you want and name body parts. I'm not sure it's necessary. Is my child really at risk for HPV? HPV? So common, it infects both females and males and you can protect your child today. Why at 11 or 12 years old? <clears throat> now, I think this is a great slide. When you put the bike helmet on. HPV exposure, I would submit parents cannot control the time of HPV exposure. You cannot control their partner and their partner's history. You want to give every tool, every defense that your child could possibly have to not get this infection and the resulting tumor. Let's put that bike helmet on before they get on the bike. Okay, my kid really doesn't need it. You know, why 11 or 12? Again, that 14 and under, 9 to 14, there is such a ro robust immune response. That's why that window is, is so important. We only need two shots then, and we get a, a, a greater total effect than the three-shot regimen for older folks. We can do it in two doses if it's before 15. And again, we start losing control over these kids as they get into their teenage years. As I said before, mom and dad's IQ starts to drop about this time, maybe a little more control with the 11 and 12 year olds. Let's get this started. 
as soon as possible. Would you give HPV vaccine to your kids? Yes, both my daughters got it when they were 12, 13 years old. It's endorsed by every possible group involved with children and cancer. In the dental office, it's more than appropriate to talk about it. We need to talk about it. You don't want your patients having these oral pharyngeal cancers. What are the cancer risks? Everyone is at risk for it, men especially. And unlike oral, can oral cavity cancers, more anterior in the mouth, smoking and drinking are not risk factors. It is entirely HPV. 70% of them are 16 and 18. There are an additional five that make up 10% more, and then, and then a, a smattering from there make up the remainder. Public health really wants dentistry involved. We see patients more often than they see their primary care doc. There's a point of contact there that we need to take advantage of, all of us do. We can talk about the HPV vaccine, vaccines in general, in a different environment than the physician's office, the primary care office, maybe a little more approachable. You might get some initial pushbacks and you're a dentist. Yeah, you're right. And I don't want you to have oral pharyngeal cancer. Pretty simple. I've been beating this drum all the way through the presentation here. It's a binary choice, cancer prevention with a vaccine or treatment. <clears throat> that case we looked at, Surgery to debulk, radiation and chemotherapy to deal with metastatic disease. Sure sounds like fun to me for a couple of shots in childhood. A common uh, statement is we're going to cure cancer. Let's cure cancer. Let's find the cure. Different statements like that. Why don't we just prevent it to begin with? The HPV vaccine does that for us. How do you talk about it with patients? Uh, you know, brochures, posters uh, available in your reception area. And um, I, I think this second line is key to establish a practice philosophy on how to approach HPV and oral cancer. So in this discussion in an office meeting, you're gonna talk about that tumor that comes in and sits down in the chair, or you do your exam, you have that patient say, oh, with a, with the uh, mirror as far back as they tolerate, and there's that bump that comes up on one side, ulcerated, gray. You have that discussion ahead of time with everybody, front and back office, as to how we're gonna react. You already have a system in place for referral, and it's urgent. These people need to know what's going on. Treatment needs to start as soon as possible. Additionally, you're gonna talk about the uh, HPV vaccine and how important it is. Depending on the circumstances of a private practice, um, if you have any anti-vaxxers, you, 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 an opportunity here to say is that you're entitled to your opinions, but as an employee here, you're not gonna talk about that. However system mechanism you have in your particular practice situation, speak to that before you do your educationals, before you start talking to patients. Talking points, the CDC has got a lot of material uh, to, to uh, share with uh, patients, American Cancer Society, Academy of Pediatrics. There's a lot of material out there that you can give to patients to give them uh, uh, you know, something to look at outside the office. We've got a unique role here. I had a new hygienist come in and start to work, outstanding practitioner. And her opening line with the patient was, how are your teeth? No. How is your mouth? Are you having any problems in your mouth? From the mammalian border to the posterior oropharynx, we're looking at all of those systems, all of those areas. Practice cancer prevention, talk about the HPV vaccine, talk about HPV, make referrals for vaccinations, or if you've decided to vaccinate in the office, collaborate with your OMS, with your primary care. 
And again, engage the team, have everybody on board, create a pro vaccine environment. Mentioned some uh, patient education tools. Um, they're there to hand out to give more information. Here's another one. This is the uh, uh, CDC website. Can't reinforce this enough, align communication with the mission. That experience that uh, we had at OHSU really drove it home. You need to be on the same page, share key points. Same message is given in the back as is given in the front. This is an opportunity for CE, um, uh, net conferences, webinars like this, uh, to keep everybody up to speed with uh, vaccine schedules, uh, efficacy, the safety, etc. HPV vaccine is cancer prevention. Let's stop these before they start. You are the key. You're the one who's going to make this happen. It is part of the dental experience. It's part of the dental office. That's what I have for you today. We've got some. Uh, um, reminders here. And then are there any questions? All right. Well, you're typing your questions. And thanks, Dr. Haggerty. Um, let's go over um, some uh, CME and some other things to remember. So we will send you instructions about how to plan your credit today. Uh, please claim your certificate of attendance or your credit to complete the program evaluation. Keep in mind that activity code expires in one week and our recordings are on our YouTube channel. This one is going to be posted within a week and I'll email you the link to our channel. And this is the activity code for today at 61HOME, 61HOME. And now let's go to the questions. Linda, yes, it will be shareable later. Yes, um, if you see under the handouts section on your GoToWebinar, you can download the presentation as well as the schedule for HPV vaccination and some um, dental health and HPV handouts. Um, if you're having any trouble downloading these, please send me an email. I'll be happy to help you. Let's see. Questions? Okay, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for being with us today and have a great day. <laughs> Goodbye.